Catherine DeRee. Sorry about that. The recording's just started. I'm Catherine DeVries. I'm the co-president of the IMBIS trainee board. And in this conference series, we're pleased to present our carefully selected speakers from our 2020 conference, which unfortunately we had to cancel. Um, but I'm pleased that we're able to do it virtually this summer. And next summer, we are going to be back in person July 21st through 23rd. That's 2022 in Montreal. Um, and also just want to highlight next week, we have our last virtual conference series. That's going to be Monday, August 2nd at 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. So check out the Invis website for more details on registering for that. Today, we have with us our second place winner of our pitch competition, Katie Liu, who will present her five minute research pitch. And it's really interesting. But first we have our main presentation by Kimberly Noble. She is a professor of neuroscience and education at Teachers College Columbia University. And as a neuroscience and a board certified pediatrician, she directs the Neurocognition Early Experience and Development Lab. And she and her team study socioeconomic inequality um, and how it relates to children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development. So Kim will present her work and then we'll have a question and answer time. So feel free to enter your questions into the chat during the presentation and then she will answer them when she's done speaking. So take it away, Kim. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Let me just go ahead and share my slides. All right, so it's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, so we're gonna talk today about socioeconomic inequality and how it relates to children's cognitive and brain development. Um, so we all know that early experience shapes children's brain development, and the brain is arguably most plastic or able to be malleable by experience uh, early in childhood. Uh, but of course, a child's experience varies tremendously as a function of uh, their family's social and economic circumstance. And so we can use social and economic factors as a lens through which to better understand early brain plasticity. And so taking a step back to make sure we're all on the same page, when we say we're studying uh, how poverty relates to brain development, what do we actually mean? How do we define poverty? So uh, poverty is defined in the United States uh, as a lack of economic resources needed to attain a minimal of stan standard of living. And here in the US, the uh, federal government sets poverty thresholds according to family size and composition, meaning the number of adults and children in the home. Uh, interestingly, that poverty line doesn't vary geographically. So uh, a family of four in New York City has the same poverty line set for them as a family in rural South Dakota, uh, even though, of course, the, the uh, cost of living is quite different in those places. And the current poverty line for a family with two adults and two children is set at just over $26,000. And although that's a quite low number to try to raise a family of four on, poverty is nonetheless quite common. Uh, currently impacting just over 17% of children nationwide. And uh, that's compared to just over 11% of all individuals. So children are living in poverty at higher rates than adults. And when we talk about socioeconomic status, which I'll use interchangeably with, thing, with terms like socioeconomic disparities, socioeconomic factors, socioeconomic circumstance or uh, characteristics, we're talking about more than just poverty. So uh, I mentioned that poverty is defined based on family income, whereas SES comprises income, but other characteristics as well, things like parents' educational attainment, occupational prestige, and subjective social status, or where one sees oneself on the social hierarchy. And we know that when we conceptualize childhood SES in this way, it tends to be associated with a number of important cognitive developmental outcomes, things like achievement tests, grade retention, literacy, IQ, and school graduation rate, to name a few. And in fact, the socioeconomic gap in achievement tends to emerge early and really widen throughout the elementary years. So the data I'm about to show you come from the British cohort study of 1970, which followed tens of thousands of children in the UK longitudinally from about age two to about age 10. 
Um, and here on the y-axis, we have cognitive performance in percentile or where children were performing relative to their same age peers. So I'm first going to draw your attention to children who at age two were performing at the 90th percentile on this cognitive battery. So outperforming 90% uh, of other two-year-olds. And these were kids who happened to come from socioeconomically advantaged homes. So those children who were from higher SES backgrounds who were high early scorers tended to perform above average throughout uh, the course of childhood. Next, let's consider children who uh, started out performing at the 10th percentile at age two and who came from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. So those children who were from lower SES backgrounds and who were low early scorers tended to perform below average throughout much of the course of childhood. So far, nothing I've shown you is tremendously surprising. A bit more surprising, though, is what happened to what we might term the so-called crossover groups. So next, let's consider children who also started out performing at the 10th percentile, but who came from more advantaged backgrounds. So those children who were from higher SES backgrounds, but who were low early scorers, tended to rise in their uh, relative ranking over the course of childhood, such that by age 10, they were performing at or even a little bit above average. And finally, and most disconcertingly, we can ask, what happened to those children who at age two were outperforming 90% of other two-year-olds, but who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds? So those children actually fell in their relative ranking over the course of childhood, such that by age 10, family socioeconomic factors are actually a much better predictor of cognitive development than is early cognitive skill. And of course, nobody lost absolute skills. Everyone was gaining uh, in terms of their absolute cognitive performance. But when we consider performance relative to same age peers, we see the emergence of these dramatic disparities. And so while this is a, a particularly stark illustration of uh, when and how we see those disparities, it doesn't really answer the question as to what factors are contributing to this gap in achievement. And we can likely think of many differences in nutrition or access to healthcare, perhaps exposure to environmental toxicants like secondhand smoke or lead, differences in the home learning environment or schooling or family stress. And to this laundry list and the many others that we could all come up with, I would say really, yes, each of these has been shown to contribute in part to the link between socioeconomic factors and children's cognitive skill. So how do we make sense of that? Well, one way is to recognize that so-called cognitive skill is really too broad of an outcome, by which I mean that traditional achievement measures like IQ or high school graduation rates aren't specific in terms of brain function, right? There's no high school graduation nucleus in our brain. So we can be much more specific in asking which particular cognitive skills and corresponding brain circuitry are most strongly associated with family socioeconomic factors. And that really brings us to a neuroscience approach. So neuroscience, of course, of course teaches us that different structures and circuits in the brain support different cognitive skills. And so by taking a neuroscience approach, we can ask which core cognitive systems are most highly associated with socioeconomic factors. And so that was the approach that we took uh, almost 20 years ago now, um, back when I was a graduate student working with Martha Farah at the University of Pennsylvania, where we recruited several socioeconomically diverse cohorts of families with children ranging in age from kindergarten on up through adolescence. And across these different cohorts, um, our findings were remarkably similar, where uh, on average, we tended to find that children from more advantaged homes often outperform children from less advantaged homes, but we found the greatest such disparities in children's language development with more modest but consistent differences in memory and certain aspects of executive functioning. And so building on that early work, uh, my lab has really set out to ask four questions. So number one, how do these differences, these socioeconomic differences in cognitive and behavioral development relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure and function? Number two, just how early are these disparities detectable? We reasoned that in those early studies, if we were already seeing dramatic differences by the time children started formal schooling, then these differences must emerge earlier, but when? Number three, which experiences, particularly modifiable experiences, seem to account for socioeconomic differences in children's cognitive and brain development? And finally, uh, how can this work inform interventions? And so we'll touch on each of these questions in turn. 
So uh, the first question, how do these differences relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure? There have now been a number of studies that have asked this question. I'll briefly show you some data from a study we published a few years ago using the PING data set, the Pediatric Imaging Neurocognition and Genetics data set, which at the time was the largest such study. Uh, more than 1,000 children and adolescents um, had participated in high-resolution MRI scanning. Um, now, these were children who uh, were recruited from socioeconomically diverse homes from around the United States, and we were able to secondarily ask to what extent do family socioeconomic factors relate to uh, various aspects of brain structure. And so, uh, somewhat to our surprise, we found that the answer was quite a bit. So everywhere you see uh, color is a point where higher family income was associated with a larger cortical surface area at that point. And so we saw this uh, association between family income and cortical surface area across nearly the entire surface of the brain. But some regions uh, depicted in yellow were regions where this association was particularly pronounced. So areas like inferior frontal gyrus and parts of the temporal lobe that are important for language development and parts of medial front, prefrontal uh, cortex and the interior cingulate gyrus that are important for executive functioning. So the structural uh, uh, data really recapitulated what we had previously found behaviorally. And there are a couple key points to take away. Uh, number one, this link between family income and children's brain structure wasn't linear. So in fact, we found the strongest relationship between family income and uh, cortical surface area among the most disadvantaged children. And so that means that dollar for dollar, relatively small differences in family income were associated with proportionately greater differences in brain structure among children from the more disadvantaged families. And second, uh, this point is really key, uh, there was tr tremendous variability from one child to the next, by which I mean there were plenty of children from higher income homes with smaller cortical surfaces, plenty ch of children from lower income homes with larger cortical surfaces. So on average, across this sample of around 1,100 children and teens, we saw this link between family income and brain structure, but in no way could I know an individual child's family income and predict with any accuracy what that particular child's brain would look like. Okay. So moving on. Uh, to the next question, just how early are these differences detectable? Again, we reasoned if we're already seeing uh, differences in cognitive development by kindergarten, differences must emerge earlier, but when? So uh, our first foray into investigating this, uh, we did looking at uh, children's cognitive development, so looking at language and memory. Uh, in a study where we followed uh, children longitudinally either from nine to 15 or 15 to 21 months of age. Here on the y-axis, we have a language composite uh, with units of z-scores. So a score of zero means they are performing at the average for the sample in that age group. And for display purposes, uh, I've divided the sample into uh, children from the most highly educated parents shown in blue, children of middle educated parents shown in uh, red, and children uh, whose parents had the lowest educational attainment shown in green. And what you can see is that from 9 to 15 months, the lines are pretty flat, so we're not really seeing the emergence of socioeconomic disparities yet. But from 15 to 21 months, what we're seeing is that uh, this blue line is rising to the top of the distribution, whereas unfortunately this green line is falling to the bottom of the distribution. Uh, and in fact, this difference between the blue line and the green line at 21 months of age is not just statistically significant, but clinically significant as well. So the difference here uh, between these two points is about 0.8 standard deviations, so a large effect size. And to put that uh, in context, that's equivalent in magnitude to about 12 IQ points. Now, again, this wasn't uh, an IQ test. It was a composite of language measures, but it nonetheless gives you a sense of just how large the disparities are before children even turn two. And we saw a very similar pattern for memory development as well. Now, what about taking a look under the hood? Uh, so before I showed you images uh, using MRI, with infants and toddlers, there are some people who attempt to do MRI, but it's a lot more challenging. So we have historically used a different tool in the toolbox, namely electroencephalography or EEG uh, shown here. 
uh, where the child wears this net of electrodes on their head. They can sit comfortably on his or her caretaker's lap. Uh, it's much more forgiving to movement and most children tolerate it quite well. And using this EEG cap, we can measure the electrical activity of the brain uh, by amplifying the signal of the, at the uh, scalp. And then we take the signal and use software to decompose it into oscillations that occur in different frequency bands that look like this. And while everybody has some of everything, some high frequency signal and some lower frequency signal, we know from past work from other labs that in many cases, children who are at risk for learning and attention problems often exhibit uh, more low frequency power and less high frequency power compared to other children. So uh, a few years ago, uh, I was working with Natalie Brito, who at the time was a postdoc in my lab. She's now an assistant professor at NYU. And she was interested in asking the question as to whether we would see any evidence for socioeconomic disparities in brain function as measured in, in uh, using infant EEG. And she was interested in really pushing the envelope and asking, you know, just how early might we detect these differences? And so she used EEG in neonatal infants, so infants who had been alive just for uh, a few days. And she asked whether there was any link between socioeconomic factors, so parents' educational attainment or family income, and resting brain function as measured using EEG. And her answer was a resounding no. So she found absolutely no evidence for any association between either parents' education or family income and uh, resting brain function in any frequency band anywhere across the scalp. Um, and so while this doesn't definitively uh, suggest that, this, that subsequent findings are related certainly to postnatal brain development, it's at least consistent with the fact, uh, with the notion that postnatal experience may be contributing to uh, the emergence of disparities after birth. And indeed, in a subsequent study uh, where she looked at infants between six and 12 months of age, she did find early evidence suggesting links between uh, both maternal education and family income and higher frequency brain power. So this then le leads to the question as to what experiences might be explaining these differences. If we're not seeing differences at birth, but we're seeing differences later on, what postnatal experience might be contributing to the emergence of these disparities in brain and behavior. And so I showed you this slide before, of course, there are many other possible causes as well. And my lab were particularly interested in two of these, namely the home language environment and family stress. And so I'll quickly walk you through uh, some studies that have explored both of those uh, pathways. So many of you are likely familiar with this work. This is, of course, the work of Hart and Risley, who uh, followed a group of children uh, a number of decades ago, longitudinally for the first several years of life. Every month, they went into these children's homes and for a few hours tape recorded uh, what the child was hearing and saying. They then took these recordings back to the lab where some poor graduate student had to transcribe every word the child heard and every word that they said. Um, and they found that at each age, children from more advantaged homes tended to hear more words than children from less advantaged homes. And so extrapolating this out over every waking hour over the first several years of the children's lives, Hart and Risley calculated that this amounted to a 30 million word gap uh, in terms of the number of words heard uh, from children in more advantaged homes compared to less advantaged homes. Now that particular number has been debated in recent years, um, but regardless of whether 30 million words is actually the right estimate, I think most studies are pretty consistent that uh, we see socioeconomic differences, not only in the number of words heard, but also in the complexity and responsiveness of verbal interactions in the home. Uh, work by Erica Hoff and others has suggested that the number of words children hear tends to be related to their uh, vocabulary. And I showed you earlier that uh, certain parts of the brain that seem to be particularly sensitive to differences in family income are parts that uh, are known to support children's language development. And so we reasoned that perhaps these differences in the home language environment might explain socioeconomic differences in brain structure in language related regions. Now, we had it a bit easier than uh, Hart and Risley and their uh, 
graduate students were able to take advantage of this device, which is called the LENA, stands for Language Environment Analysis. Um, it's basically a small digital recorder that fits into specialized clothing that the child wears. Uh, they can wear it for up to 16 hours, and then assuming they give us the recorder back, we can upload the data. And the LENA software tells us uh, over the course of the day when the child heard uh, adult words, when the child themselves made vocalizations, and also when they were engaged in conversational terms or back and forth uh, verbal interactions. And so, uh, along with my former postdoc, Emily Mers, who's now an assistant professor at uh, Colorado State, we investigated the extent to which conversational turns would be associated with language-related brain structure, uh, specifically looking at that left parasylvian region. And indeed, uh, Emily found that children, and this was in a sample of five to nine-year-old children, uh, she found that children who experienced more hourly conversational turns tended to have a larger surface area in this uh, language-related brain region. And indeed, uh, this uh, brain structural difference partially accounted for socioeconomic disparities in reading skill in this sample. Now, interestingly, she found no link between children's brain structure and their own vocalization count. And that was important because this was a cross-sectional study, and so, you know, one explanation might be, okay, conversational turns are shaping brain structure, but another explanation could have been perhaps children uh, with uh, larger cortical surface area in language-related regions are naturally chattier and are having more conversations. Uh, but the fact that we didn't see a link between brain structure and children's own vocal, uh, vocalization count suggested that that interpretation was less likely. Okay. Um, now we're also interested in uh, how family stress may play a role in shaping uh, brain development and contributing to disparities. Uh, now, of course, we know that when parents are distracted or depressed, that family life is more likely to be characterized by conflict and emotional withdrawal uh, and less likely to exhibit the kinds of warm and nurturing parenting that we know is so important for child development. Uh, work in our lab, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and many others have suggested that uh, in many cases, socioeconomically disadvantaged children may have altered levels of stress hormones. And we know that there are certain areas of the brain, such as the hippocampus and prefrontal limbic circuitry, that are both associated with socioeconomic factors and that are highly sensitive to the experience of stress. And so we reason that perhaps exposure to chronic stress may account for socioeconomic differences in those brain regions. <clears throat> and so in another study also led by Emily Mers, uh, we looked at children's hair cortisol. So taking a small sample of hair, you can get the average level of cortisol uh, the child experienced over the last several months. Um, and she found that children with higher levels, of higher concentrations of hair cortisol tended to have a smaller hippocampal volume. Uh, consistent with the animal literature, this was uh, specifically driven by differences in the CA3 and dentate gyrus. And indeed, hair cortisol in this sample mediated the link between socioeconomic factors and hippocampal volume. And so um, I've been trying to, for the first portion of this talk, paint a picture by which we think that socioeconomic disparities lead to differences in experience, such as differences in the home language environment or differences in exposure to stress. And in turn, that these differences in experience likely work together to shape brain and ultimately cognition. And so if we're right and experience matters, it begs the question as to whether this work can inform interventions. And if so, what's the right level at which to intervene? Um, certainly we can imagine intervening at the level of cognition itself, most commonly through school-based interventions. We can, of course, imagine uh, intervening at the level of experience by interventions that, for example, aim to reduce stress or uh, increase conversational terms. Or we can imagine intervening, perhaps at the societal level, by reducing socioeconomic disparities themselves. And thinking um, along the latter lines, we know uh, work by social, by social scientists has suggested that relatively small differences in annual income in childhood tend to predict better outcomes when those children grow up. 
So for example, just a $4,000 difference in annual income between the prenatal year and age two uh, had been shown to predict improved cognitive development, increased adult earnings when those children grow up, increased time spent in the labor force, and even some evidence for improved health when children grow up. <clears throat> But the majority of those studies are correlational, and of course, we all know that correlation is not causation. And there are many people who would say, well, sure, uh, poverty or income is associated with differences in those outcomes, but might not be causing those outcomes. And so in order to really uh, address that question head on, we need to move past correlation to really understand whether income early in life causes differential outcomes later on. And that's really the basis of the baby's first year study, which is the first randomized controlled trial of poverty reduction in early childhood. This is a multidisciplinary effort led by a number of principal investigators uh, spanning disciplines of economics, developmental psychology, social policy, and neuroscience. And so what are we actually doing in baby's first years? Uh, so back in the spring of 2018, we began recruiting 1,000 low-income mothers shortly after they gave birth in a number of hospitals around the country. Uh, upon enrolling in the study, mothers were given a debit card and were told that each month they would receive an unconditional cash gift that they were free to spend however they like. But mothers were randomized into either the high cash gift group who's receiving $333 a month or the low cash gift group who's receiving $20 a month. So that difference in annual income of approximately $4,000 a year was chosen both because of the evidence I just showed you from the social science literature, suggesting that about $4,000 a year is likely to make a difference for children. It was also chosen because it's an amount similar to other social services and benefits that low-income mothers are likely to qualify for, things like uh, food stamps or, of course, recently, uh, the expanded child tax credit. So we certainly didn't know that was going to be happening back when we began planning the study almost 10 years ago. So uh, the uh, debit card comes preloaded in the hospital and automatically reloads every month on the anniversary of the child's birthday. Uh, we launched in 2018, spent the next 12 months recruiting the participants, uh, completed the age one follow-up in uh, last summer, just completed the age two follow-up a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, launched the age three follow-up at the same time. Now, to date, we've put about $4 million into the pockets of the low-income mothers in the study. Uh, and so in this way, we're going to be able to assess the causal impact of poverty reduction on children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development in the first several years of life. How do we think that these increased economic resources are likely to make a difference for the families? We've got two main pathways we're hypothesizing. One we're calling the increased investment pathway. And that's the idea that with greater economic resources, moms are more likely to be able to purchase things like books or toys, perhaps higher quality childcare, maybe better housing or safer neighborhoods. The other we're calling the reduced stress pathway. And that's the idea that with more economic resources, moms may be less worried about how they're going to pay their monthly rent check or keep the lights on and have more bandwidth to be able to provide the kind of warm and nurturing parenting that we know is important for children. Now, chances are these different pathways may operate differently in different families. And so although we're measuring them carefully along the way, our ultimate outcomes of interest really center on the children. Uh, so with apologies for the busy slide, this is just showing you where we are now. Um, we were about two thirds of the way through age one data collection, which started out as a home visit where uh, we were administering a survey, observing and uh, video recording parent-child interactions, getting a measure of uh, stress physiology through maternal hair cortisol and doing uh, infant brain activity uh, using mobile EEG. Uh, so we were about two thirds of the way through that when the pandemic hit uh, last March. So at that point, we quickly pivoted to uh, finishing up age one data collection by phone. Obviously we weren't able to do uh, the measures that require being in person, but we were able to complete the survey for uh, uh, the vast majority of moms, as I'll show you in a moment. We uh, had originally hoped to do another home visit at age two, but uh, again, we're unable to do so because of the pandemic, so completed age two data collection by phone. 
And initially, when we set out uh, to launch the study, we envisioned that age three would be a capstone wave of data collection where we brought all of the families into our university labs. Um, about a year ago now, we realized that uh, age three, which uh, the children just started turning a few weeks ago, even in summer of 2021, it might not be feasible to bring families into the lab because of the pandemic. So we went back to our funders and uh, explained the situation and they very generously agreed to extend the cash gifts for another year. So now families will be getting cash gifts through age four. Uh, so age three is currently again a phone survey and we're busily planning for uh, next summer when we'll begin age four data collection in the labs. Along the way, we're also collecting information about the transactions that uh, moms are engaging in with the debit card. There is a qualitative sub-study where a number of mothers are getting uh, repeated in-depth interviews to really understand how this cash gift affects their day-to-day -day lives. And we've also gotten permission from mothers to follow up with administrative records so we can understand, for example, uh, how the cash gift impacts social services and benefits. So as I mentioned, we've had uh, quite successful retention. For age one, we had uh, just over 93% retention. Uh, and I believe age two, which just finished a couple of weeks ago, we had about 92% retention. So really excellent retention um, over the course of the first couple of years of the study. Uh, as I mentioned, we had to conduct some of the surveys for age one uh, in person and then the rest over the phone. Uh, the in-person sample sizes range a bit as well. The cash gift is dispersed on a debit card branded for my baby. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it automatically reloads each month on the day of the child's birthday and the mom gets a text reminder at each disbursement. Now, I've been using the word cash gift very carefully. It is legally defined as a gift, which means we're not asking for anything from the mom in return. She can never do another, uh, never participate in another uh, data collection event again, and she'll still get the money. And that's important because rendering it a gift means it's not taxable. And it also means that uh, in, many, in nearly all cases, it doesn't count uh, in determining her eligibility for government benefits or social services. We actually worked very hard to ensure that that would be the case before the launch of the study. So led by uh, principal investigators, Catherine Magnuson and Lisa Genetian, uh, we in some cases got approval agency by agency to say that for these moms, this money won't count in determining eligibility for certain services or benefits. Uh, and in two of our four uh, data collection sites, we actually got state legislation passed again saying that for these moms, this money won't count in determining their eligibility. Uh, this is the slide showing where $4,000 uh, was spent in the first year. Um, most transactions took place at ATM. You can see that there's a good deal of variability there. Uh, Lisa Genetian, who's an economist at Duke, is working on analyzing this transaction data. One thing I like to point out that we often get questions about is that of the $4,000 uh, a year that the moms in the high cash gift group received, on average, just $15 was spent at a tobacco or liquor store. And we have um, another paper being led by graduate student Paul Yu, suggesting that we're really not seeing any differences in um, uh, temptation good expenditures or substance use in the two groups after one year. Uh, now I'm going to quickly walk you through some uh, data that I'm very excited about. So uh, asking about how did the first 12 months of cash gifts affect uh, children's brain activity? And I'm just going to ask that you please not take screenshots or post on social media or otherwise disseminate the findings that I'm about to share with you. They've not yet been peer reviewed and we're very mindful of um, the potential implications. Uh, this is not quite right. We wrapped up age two data collection a couple weeks ago, just launched uh, age three, uh, where we're conducting a phone survey and uh, we'll be bringing the families into our university labs next year to do a thorough state-of-the-art uh, assessment of language development, executive function, social emotional development, brain function using both resting EEG and ERP. We'll be collecting both child and maternal stress physiology, child and maternal body mass index, and a few measures that we weren't able to collect 
for completely collected ages one and two, including another measure of parent-child interaction. We'll be getting maternal executive function and we'll be collecting swabs for epigenetics from both mom and child. So uh, it's our hope that baby's first years will have the potential to provide evidence of poverty reduction on the developing child and family life. It's clear that the policy landscape has changed dramatically since we first launched this study or first started planning this study about nine years ago, uh, most notably with the uh, expanded child tax credit that was unveiled earlier this month. It's our hope that baby's first years, given its randomized control trial design, will inform debates on the generosity or cuts both to existing safety net programs as well as new programs like these tax refunds and uh, child allowances. Because while income may not be the only or even the most important factor in determining child development, it may be one that's most easily changed by policy. Uh, so with that, I'm going to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, many thanks to my uh, co-PIs, uh, co-investigators, lab, and of course, our generous funders, and most importantly, to the moms and children who are participating in the study. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, we are going to open to questions now, so please drop your questions in the chat. Um, but I would love to start with a question. I, I'm curious about if you are tracking other adverse childhood events and how the higher cash income might even reduce other adverse childhood events. Yeah, no, I'm, I just gave you sort of a snippet of what we're measuring. We are measuring a number of those. So parent incarceration, we're measuring uh, uh, a number of aspects of uh, parent relationship, so, you know, who's in the home, whether parents are married or not, um, uh, what else? So mom's mental health, mom's substance use, um, uh, domestic violence. So yes, we're measuring a lot of that. Right, because that's such a complex relationship. So as you're shifting that, that actually might reduce some of the other adversities that those children may have experienced. So Absolutely, and I think there's a good chance it's going to be different for one family to the next. So in many cases, while we may not see statistically significant impacts on any one outcome, we still may see impacts on children. And so some of the qualitative that might show up. So interesting. Okay, we have lots of questions here. Um, how might researchers go about comparing studies that define SES using different measures? Do you recommend some greater level of standardization across studies of SES? Um, yeah, it's actually a problem. So there are lots of different measures. Um, different people use different things, you know, maternal education or average parents education or family income or income to needs, which is income relative to the poverty line. Uh, we try to measure multiple things. Um, and when I, you know, when we first started this line of work, we sort of combined things into an SES composite, but uh, have really shied away from doing that in the last 10 to 15 years or so. Um, largely because my social science colleagues say, you know, that's fine, but you're really sort of doing a disservice because you can't you, know, you can't do an intervention on SES, right? You can potentially change parents' education or family income, but um, SES as a construct to enact an intervention on doesn't really make a lot of sense. And they tend to reflect different aspects of children's experience. So we do try to disambiguate the two. Um, I think it would be excellent for the field to uh, come up with one standard set of questionnaires. Um, there was a paper uh, by Seth Pollock a couple of years ago that um, suggested a way to do that. And so that, you know, it would be wonderful, I think, for the field to generally uh, ask the same question so that we could compare differences and compare apples to apples. Uh, do you know of any studies showing that lower socioeconomic status who are better on certain behavioral tasks like spatial processing have enhanced development of the functional brain suggesting some sort of resilience. Yeah, this is a, a really exciting new uh, sort of subfield that people have begun pursuing. So people like uh, Bruce Ellis have started writing about exactly that. So sort of this hidden talents framework where, um, you know, essentially rather than thinking about disadvantage as leading to some sort of, of uh, delay or deviant 
brain development, it probably is um, more reflective of actual neuroplasticity to think about the brain as an adaptive organ that adapts to your experience. So for example, um, you know, work that has suggested that children from lower SES backgrounds are more likely to show lower scores on selective attention. Well, that actually might be adaptive, right? If it makes sense for you to maintain vigilance um, on your surroundings, it may actually be adaptive to not selectively attend to whatever is in front of you. And so uh, Bruce and others have really been uh, exploring exactly this question, whether there may actually be enhancements um, related to disadvantage. There was a work that came, a paper that came out of Nim Tottenham's lab just like a month or two ago. Um, that looked, in this case, it looked at previously institutionalized children, but it suggested that uh, different executive function skills may be affected differently uh, with actually some improvement, um, perhaps associated with some, some skills. Cool. Um, are you gonna continue to follow the cohort to observe differences? like throughout K through 12? I hope so, right? If the funding gods agree. So we certainly hope to keep, uh, to continue to uh, follow up with these families for a long time. We're just now, you know, as you know, grant cycles tend to go in five-year increments. And so uh, we are just now starting to plan for sort of the next wave of funding beyond age four. And, but absolutely, you know, we hope to continue to follow these families long-term. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Nora has a question. Nora, do you want to unmute to ask your question and talk about that? Oh, thanks for letting me. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Um, so um, you, like lots of other people, really concentrate on, you know, language and executive function and social interaction. But in your initial slide, you um, also show SES um, being associated with memory. And although you don't talk about spatial, I just want to mention this hobby horse of mine, other things, including some pubs of mine, do show some associations where lower SES kids That's also we, have, we have at least spatial. one paper with that too. Yeah. yeah, and you had one, right. So, but concentrating on memory and looking at the EEG results, um, there's a really big literature, especially from rodents, on theta being associated with memory, basically because of timing synchrony for episodic mm -hmm. memory. And there's some from humans too. So I think the reason that you are finding what you're finding is because you can't localize theta to the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. I think, but sort of that's my question. Like, I don't want to let everybody run around saying, oh, theta bad, because yeah. focal theta is good. Oh, that's very interesting. So I don't know a lot about that literature. Um, of course, the resting EEG signal is cortically driven, so we're not getting any signal from hippocampus, so it's hard to say. Um, and we don't have any... Or, we took some parent report measures of uh, behavior at age one, but we don't have any direct assessment of infant behavior at age one. Uh, and we didn't look at memory either because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, but we've sort of limited most of our behavior, planned behavioral assessments for, um, you know, these large mm -hmm. standardized validated type measures that you have for language and executive function, but yeah. not for memory. So it's an excellent and interesting question. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to answer it at least in the near term in BFY. But. I'd be happy to talk offline because even with only the cortical stuff and it's yeah. pretty crude and you can't really do localization, there are some data um, that do suggest that you can find some associations, but let's talk about that. Yeah, that's definitely, that'd be yeah. great. Okay, great. Um, Renee Grimes wants to know, um, are you gonna ask questions about how COVID impacted the family income compared? Yeah. Study. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So in the age two survey, we asked a lot about how COVID affected the families, both in terms of things like employment and income, and also in terms of health of family members. So uh, since we just wrapped up age two, I don't know what the, those data show yet. Um, but yes, we are certainly looking at, uh, at least descriptively at how COVID affected the families. And uh, you know, to the extent that we can potentially, whether it moderated 
findings. It's difficult. It'll be easier, I guess, during age two, where uh, you know the entire sample was assessed in the same way, and it was all after the pandemic. With age one, it's complicated because before the pandemic was interviewed in person, whereas after the onset of the pandemic was interviewed over the phone. So a couple different factors being completed there. Right, I would assume areas of the country would be very different too, based on like Twin Cities versus New York's like gonna be. So we include site-based controls in all of our analyses. For the most part, we're not seeing large, uh, significant site-based differences, but sometimes you see uh, you know, what you might call substantive differences. So it really comes to a question of power, whether we have the power to find differences, um, and even if not, you know, whether there are differences that seem to be there in terms of effect sizes, even if they don't reach significance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did the moms receive any instructions or education regarding the increase in verbal interactions or reading to the children? What, what did they know and understand about the study? Right. Um, so no, by design, right? So we really designed it to be a pure test of the effects of income as opposed to income bundled with financial literacy or mental health or anything else that you could bundle income with. Um, so, uh, so we don't know what they knew or didn't know, but we are measuring things like that, right? How much they're reporting reading to the children, for example. Right. Interesting. Um, and Isabel wants to know, will you explore the role of formal education as a variable? We are exploring the, well, yes to both, I guess. So we are exploring the impact on formal education. So whether moms get more educational training is one question. And then secondarily, baseline education level is a covariate in all of our analyses. Um, had you considered in baby's first year study some comparisons to a no cash gift control group? Yeah, we considered it, right? So um, in the end, you know, and if resources were unlimited, perhaps we would have a third arm with nothing. And people often also ask, what about, similar to the last question, you know, what about comparing it to X, Y, or Z other intervention? So you could imagine if resources were unlimited, comparing the cash to lots of things. Um, in the end, we decided on the low cash gift group because we felt that $20 a month is nominal enough that it probably wouldn't make a dramatic difference in their day-to-day -day lives, but it still gives the same structure of the intervention. So everyone gets a debit card, everyone gets this automatic reload, everyone gets a text message from us each month, right? So the structure is identical. Really? Really interesting work. Thank you so much for giving us the time. Oh, uh, quick. She oh, said, yeah. sorry, I meant children's formal education. Yeah. Uh, so we, so to date, right, we've only gotten through, we just launched age three. So we're asking about time in childcare. Um, at age four, we'll be asking about, you know, preschool and other childcare arrangements. Um, we are currently planning for the next round, which will include age six. So looking at uh, schooling, um, hopefully getting access to school records as well. And then certainly down the road, we'd love to look at things like high school graduation or college attendance. Really, thank you so much for your time. We're so grateful that you came. Thank you so I much hope for you all me. will stay for just a few minutes. Um, Katie Liu is the second place winner of our pitch competition. And I just want to mention before she, um, we had a host of talks that are uh, five minute pitches that were sent in and we selected Katie's and then afterwards found out that she's actually going to be a senior in high school. Almost all of our other pitch winners and submissions were doctoral students. And Katie has been working with uh, her Washington University and has been doing research as a going to be senior in high school. So really interesting to hear from Katie. So Katie, go ahead and share your uh, pitch and then anyone who wants to ask her a few questions afterwards, uh, we can do that. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let me pull up the video. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, let me know if the sound doesn't work. Hello, my name is Katie Liu and I'm currently a high school junior from Lakeside School in Seattle, Washington, who enjoys learning about linguistics. I'm particularly interested in how the languages we speak affect the way we think in our cognition, which is broadly the category that my research fits into. In this video, I'm going to be talking about my research, which investigates whether a higher degree of language similarity enhances attention control in bilinguals. Now for some background information. 
Language genealogies are determined by examining lexical and morphologic features, so it makes sense that languages within the same family are more similar than languages not in the same family. Literature has also shown that due to the constant attention needed for bilinguals to keep their language system separate, bilinguals show enhanced attention control over monolingual individuals. So what does existing literature tell us about the relationship between these two things, language similarity and attention control? Some studies show no correlation between the two, such as Link et al., which found no difference in the executive functioning of Japanese English and Spanish English bilinguals. At the same time, others suggest a subtle relationship, such as Codera et al., which found that Arabic English individuals showed less effective executive processing than German English and Polish English bilinguals. This conflict may exist due to the fact that the study of similarity is a fairly new field and not enough work has been done in it to draw concrete conclusions. Therefore, to add to this growing field, I designed a study to investigate the relationship between similarity and attention control. I wanted to understand whether a higher degree of language similarity enhances attention control in bilinguals. Investigating this relationship is important because it will give us more insight into how the languages we speak affect cognition and the cognitive processes that facilitate language acquisition and maintenance. In a broader context, these findings could be used to develop strategies for more efficient language learning, which, as an example, could be applied in helping immigrants in the U.S. learn English more easily and quickly and therefore be able to participate fully in society and have access to more opportunities. We hypothesize that a higher degree of language similarity would indeed enhance attention control in bilinguals because theoretically, similar languages, due to their overlap, should be harder to keep separate and thus should demand increased attention control as supported by the findings of the previously mentioned Coderre et al. study. Now for methods. Participants in the study all spoke English as their second language and were enrolled in or graduated from college at the time of their participation. We sorted them into two groups based on their first language, which belonged to either the Indo-European or Sino-Tibetan language families. The sorting was based on language families as defined by Ethnolog, and as English is an Indo-European language, this means that the Indo-European bilinguals' languages were more similar than the Sino-Tibetan bilinguals' languages. Then, to index participant attention control, we had them complete Stroop and Flinker tasks, and we measured their reaction times on these tasks. These two are very popular psychological tests to assess attention control, and for more detailed information about them, you can refer to these previous publications. In short, incongruent conditions demand more cognitive effort because they present conflicting information, so performance on these conditions indicates attention control. For the statistical analysis, we used ANOVA to understand whether the reaction times in the Stroop and Flinker tasks differed between participant groups. Looking at the results, we found that Sino-Tibetan participants showed shorter reaction times in the incongruent Stroop task. This suggests that they had better attention control than Indo-European participants and contradicted our hypothesis that a higher degree of language similarity would predict higher attention control. So to further explore this discrepancy, we took a look at another factor that may have affected performance, the ages at which participants learned English as their second language or age of acquisition. We hypothesized that subjects with an earlier age of acquisition would have better attention control due to having exercised attention control by keeping their languages separate for longer. To test this, we performed Pearson's correlation analysis to understand the relationship between AOA and reaction times. Consistent with our hypothesis, our analysis showed that earlier AOA was significantly correlated with faster reaction times. To summarize, we found that a higher degree of language similarity predicted lower attention control while earlier age of acquisition predicted enhanced attention control. So why does it matter? First, it adds to the very limited existing body of literature surrounding language similarity and its effect on cognition. Second, it contributes to literature surrounding the bilingual advantage, specifically the question of where that advantage comes from, which our findings suggested could be age of acquisition and potentially language similarity. However, from more conclusive results as to the effects of specific variables on attention control, more studies are still necessary. Okay, that's all from my quick overview. Thank you for listening. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if you guys, anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat for Katie. Um, a really well done presentation. Um, so I'll start with one quick question. I'm just curious where you want to go from here, like from the research experience you have, 
what are you interested in exploring and, and are you interested in continuing doing research? Um, yeah, I think I would be interested in continuing research, maybe not as like, um, like a primary like profession or whatever when I'm an adult, but definitely something to continue just like learning. Um, as for like the direction of like what I'd want to be studying, that's hard to say because, you know, I'm, I'm like still in high school, so my interest will definitely change as I get older. But I mean, like this connection to linguistics is definitely something that I don't think is going to change. And like, especially after listening to Dr. Noble's talk, um, like maybe investigating more links between like language and uh, socioeconomic status and factors would be something that um, I think would be interesting. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting aspect of relating your work to Kim's work is just what about the dual language learners there and how that interaction with their socioeconomic status and yeah, really interesting. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You can see there's lots of support for you in the chat and for the work that you're doing. So thank you for entering our competition and great work. Thank you, everyone. All right, I think that ends our conference series for this week. And hopefully you will join us uh, next Monday, August 2nd. We will have our very last virtual conference series. Thanks so much and have a good day.